Well, let, let's let's get uh, the conversation going then. And Br- uh, Brandon C., um, are, are you able to unmute yourself? And uh, could you let us know a little bit more about you and what your interests are here? Are you there? And if, hey, guys. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, doing well. What's what's your interest hey. in India? Yeah, so um, just coincidentally, um, uh, last week uh, I, I worked for a software development company, and we do drone simulation. And particularly two weeks ago, we were in Las Vegas for a large event, uh, that was there every year. And uh, we had multiple different um, inquiries and uh, people uh, from India that were interested in our product. So okay. I, I I do business development. I'm the business development manager and, and head of sales for our company. And I wanted to get gain some insight, I guess, if, if you will, um, about um, all the different um, kind of caveats, aspects, you know, tricks, tips, things of that nature when doing business in India and, um, you know, okay. any specific uh, businesses to look out um, towards, you know, okay. or, or to. Yeah. Okay. Well then let's, let's kick it off. And so let me, uh, uh, Gunjan, I'll start it because uh, kind of do a, a start point so that we can clean out all of the beginning part of the recording and then kind of go from here. So uh, if you're listening, I'm about to start the, the program and then uh, we'll we'll go from there. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to a conversation with the India expert, Gunjan Bagla of the Emirate Inc. Uh, Gunjan is a member of Global Chamber. He's on our advisory board for Global Chamber Los Angeles. And he's really an advisor to businesses all over the world about India, what the opportunities are. This is the second part of a conversation uh, about India. And it was intended to be geared toward the Asia market and their understanding of India. I'm not sure we've got a lot, at least in the live version, hopefully the recorded version, we've got more uh, in Asia who are interested in understanding more about uh, China plus one and the impact uh, that India can create and in business opportunities, uh, a variety of other industries. In part one, Gunjan was extremely helpful, extremely demonstrated extreme knowledge around the markets in India. That's what he does. He helps people become successful there. And so we'll let him uh, uh, provide a, a, some uh, initial information, and then we'll have some time for questions. So, Gunjan, thank you for this second part of this series. And we'd love to hear more about not only some of the things you talked about the last time, but some of the gearing toward India that, that you talked or to toward Asia that you talked about. So thanks again for your support and collaboration. And I turn the floor to you, please. Thank you so much, Doug. It's always fun talking to Global Chamber members. So let me go full screen. Okay. Um, so uh, this presentation is geared towards talking about broad opportunities in India. I will uh, go through this as quickly as you will let me, and then we can answer the live questions from the folks who are on the call as well. Um, India has changed quite a bit in the 20 years since I started Amrit. And it is now among the top 10 trading partners to the U.S., the fifth largest economy in the world, the fastest growing economy in the G20 countries. So uh, many people don't fully realize the new opportunities that exist in India. And that is what I want to pay some attention to. So India is going to be one of the largest automotive markets in the world. Uh, and, and when they talk about automotive in India, we include things that have less than four wheels. Okay. So three wheelers, two wheelers, uh, all of those are included. Uh, there's a tremendous transformation happening towards EVs in India, much faster than anyone had predicted. Because as, as few as 10 years ago, the electric power in India was not terribly reliable. So it doesn't make sense to have an EV if you're going to charge it using a diesel generator. So that has changed really within the last six or seven years, mostly through better utilization of existing capacity and better distribution. 
So I have some examples here of the kind of investments that Indian companies are making. Tata Motors, which is based in, you know, which is whose main factory is in Pune in Western India, uh, but they also own uh, Land Rover and Jaguar. Mahindra, which is based in Mumbai. And for those of you in the US, you might know that Mahindra licensed the manufacturing of the Jeeps back, you know, shortly after the Second World War. And they still make a version of uh, a number of versions of SUVs. Uh, the investment into EVs is tremendous. Part of it is being driven by commercial applications. So small fleets for uh, supply chain issues uh, and buses and uh, uh, then two wheelers for Amazon delivery into the narrow streets of India where you can't expect a UPS or a FedEx truck to go. So it's a wide range of opportunities that is available for companies all over the world to be able to participate in the electric vehicle boom in India. In fact, one of our clients a couple of years ago is based right here in Pasadena. And he came up with, he's a former SpaceX engineer, came up with a way to take those uh, three-wheeler tuk-tuks and replace their engine with uh, electric uh, electric powertrain and battery. So uh, many, many opportunities exist in this sector. Um, so here's a few pictures of what might be considered an EV. You see that there are and electric two-wheelers, there's small commercial vehicles. Ola is a competitor to Uber in India. And then you have small vans and the tuk-tuks I talked about, small uh, small delivery vehicles. Uh, that's where a lot of the action is. Uh, the largest bicycle maker in India, in the world, is an Indian company, Hero. And they also have a vibrant business in gasoline-based two-wheelers as well as electric two-wheelers. In fact, they've invested in a company right here in Northern California called Zero Motorcycles not so long ago. So Indian companies are also investing worldwide. I talked earlier about Tata buying Land Rover and Jaguar. Here you're talking about a bicycle maker investing in California. We know that uh, oil is going to be a trading commodity in the next 20, 30 years. And Indian companies are looking at making a transition away from oil. This year, the finance minister of India announced a significant shift in investment towards hydrogen. And um, as, as some of you might know, Japan is a big player in the hydrogen industry, whether it's the production of green hydrogen, whether it is hydrogen filling stations, you know, any aspect of the hydrogen economy. And um, I have this point here that people from listening in from Japan should see India as a major, major opportunity across the entire spectrum of the hydrogen economy. You see on the right, this table which shows so many of India's oil companies, Reliance, Indian Oil, ONGC, which is a exploration company, uh, Indian Oil and ONGC are largely government-owned, then the Gas Authority of India, which is also significantly government-owned, the National Thermal Power Corporation, which mostly runs uh, coal-fired power stations, all of them are investing big time into hydrogen. And India doesn't have its basic hydrogen technology, so they're looking for people from all over the world who supply uh, the things that are necessary for the transition to hydrogen. Renewable energy has always been an important part of India's economy, but the current government of Narendra Modi, when they took over in 2014, they really put solar energy on, on a turbo path. The goal of the previous government was to get 20 gigawatts by 2020, but you see India is already now in 2023 at uh, you know, 168 gigawatts of uh, of uh, renewable energy, out of which 65 gigawatts or so is from solar power. Some of the largest utility scale solar farms are being built in the Western states of India here, Rajasthan, which is a desert state and Gujarat, which is the prime minister's home state. There's a number of large farms being, utility scale farms being built. 
and some of them are already operational. So if anything that goes into the solar uh, generation system, whether it's the, it's the uh, panels, the electronics, the collectors, even reflective solar, any kind of solar power is a, is a big opportunity in India. India is one of the largest spenders on imported weapons and equipment. And that's of course, because it has two unfriendly neighbors, Pakistan on the Northwestern border and China on the Northeastern border. Several thousand miles of uh, border have to be protected. Uh, both, country, both countries have had wars with India. China invaded India back in 1962 and a number of wars have been fought with Pakistan. India's main concern right now around security in long term is, is a, a concern about China. So they bought these uh, General Atomics drones, again, from a Southern California company. Uh, these are armed drones that, that can carry weapons. You see that down below here. So India is buying over $3 billion of these, and some of them will actually be built and assembled in India. But for, the, for our friends in, in Asia, India also needs all kinds of supplies for its Army, Navy, and Air Force, including better clothing, shoes, helmets, uh, you name it. Uh, so we think that that continues to be a good opportunity. The Indian military is trying to encourage local manufacturing of some of these products so companies can partner with Indian entities to do that. In fact, uh, General Electric has partnered with uh, Hindustan Aeronautics, which is government-owned, to build their high-end uh, military engines for India's uh, single-engine fighter aircraft. That's a huge, huge deal uh, that was just signed uh, when uh, the Indian Prime Minister came to Washington in uh, June of this year. So many, many opportunities in defense. And it also applies to small companies. We helped a company called Trigicon, which makes uh, the sites that go on top of uh, rifles. Uh, and the advantage of the Trigicon sites is that they are, they are fueled by a tiny, tiny amount of radioactive tritium so that they never need a battery replacement, which is kind of important in, you know, if you're in the middle of a battle, you don't want to be changing batteries. So uh, it's been a great success when we took them to India. Now, many people think of India as an agricultural exporter, and that is very much true. 70, 60% of India's population depends on agriculture, most of them working on small farms. But the Indian economy has grown so rapidly that many products that India used to export are now being imported. Vegetable oils, as you see on this graph, is India's largest agricultural import. But from here in California, we ship apples and pistachios uh, all the way to India. India imports many other things, as you can see on this uh, chart. Um, India used to be a large, a very large producer of cashews, but now they import a considerable amount from Vietnam. This package here represents something, you know, the cashews coming in from Southeast Asia into India. So uh, being a large and increasingly mature economy, the trade in India is going in both directions. I chuckled when I saw that India is also importing spices. All of India's early fame going back 2000 years was based on the export of spices, but I guess there are certain spices that India doesn't produce enough of, so they are importing. Uh, alcoholic beverages, I don't know whether you'd really call that agriculture, but uh, uh, India is the largest consumer of whiskey in the world, and much of uh, they, they, they love their scotch whiskey, as well as the Japanese uh, alcoholic beverages have become very popular in India. India produces a lot of its own uh, pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, but nonetheless, it is a market for significant uh, high-end uh, nutraceuticals. Uh, I mean, that's a new name for what used to be called vitamins, minerals, and supplements. So it can be anything from uh, protein shakes to uh, fish oil to uh, any any kind of supplement that doesn't naturally grow in India or get produced in India. We do a lot of work with supplement companies that are entering India. We're working currently with a company that produces juvenile supplements and getting them into India. Um, 
in addition to re renewable power and so you know solar power and so on, India is going to be a market for nuclear energy. They already have a number of plants based on heavy water that used technology that they first licensed from Canada and then have expanded it. Uh, but the new growth will also be in what are called the small or smart nuclear reactors. Here's a picture of one uh, that is uh, uh, you know, in production or in design, I should say, by an American company. But we will see dozens of SMR designs getting licensed in the next 10 years. And as these uh, nuclear small nuclear plants become available, I suspect that a significant portion of the fuel will be supplied by Japanese companies. Several Japanese companies are very large traders in uranium, plutonium, and other radioactive materials. Uh, and a significant Korean company built a major nuclear power plant in the United Arab Emirates. And of course, they are eager to participate in the nuclear energy expansion in India. So again, I'm highlighting some of the opportunities, real and potential for Asian companies. And I will soon move to uh, sourcing from India as well. Okay. So India has is now the world's largest country by population. And most of its people are young in their 20s or early 30s and teens. And many of them don't have jobs. Uh, as India tries to grow its manufacturing capability, there's a tremendous need to train blue collar workers in India. So any company that can offer uh, excellent training to take people who grew up on farms and enable them to work in the cities, work in the factories, no matter what industry. I think any company that has that capability is going to do very well in India, uh, providing those training skills, education related to, to the semi-skilled or uh, blue collar kind of work. People really didn't think of India as a manufacturing hub, uh, but that has changed significantly. So over the years, India has been a large manufacturer of pharmaceuticals and chemicals and, uh, and a number of other products. But now we are seeing India going head to head in many sectors where China has led in the last 25 years. And some years ago, I coined this term China plus one, because we don't expect any of our clients to abandon China as a source. But being exclusively dependent on China creates a significant market risk for companies who worry about the tension between the world's largest economy, the US, and the world's second largest economy, China. So that's one factor. And many people also worry about the potential tension in the Taiwan Straits, which could cause a disruption of the supply chain from China. So smart companies are starting to put up significant portions of their manufacturing or their vendors in India. And the most significant of them in the last couple of years has been Apple, which uses Vistron and Foxconn, both of which are Taiwanese companies who produce the products for Apple, mostly in China. Now, both Foxconn and Vistron have been asked by Apple to expand their India manufacturing. I understand they already have 50,000 employees in India over the last couple of years, in Bangalore and in Chennai. In fact, I was quoted in an article in Fortune magazine that described the rapid growth of, uh, of both of those companies. They're making not only iPhones, but now they're going to assemble iPads and uh, Macintosh computers, the whole range of Apple products, including the latest ones. So the iPhone 14 is being assembled in India. Uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I visited a number of electronics factories in India that are working with companies all over the world to assemble, build products for them for sale in every country you can imagine, you, you know, including the US and Japan. India has been a supplier for of pharmaceuticals. In fact, if you take any generic medications anywhere in the world, there's a good chance that the medication was produced in India. I'm diabetic, I take metformin, I buy it from Kaiser, uh, my my HMO, and I don't I don't think I've seen any metformin that they've provided to me that wasn't made in India. 
I also take uh, statin uh, because I have a family history of, uh, of uh, blood pressure and stroke and so on. And the statins such as atorvastatin or Lipitor, as it used to be called, are also produced in very high volume in India. So India can be a source uh, for any, any kinds of uh, pharmaceuticals. And now they are getting into the APIs, the ingredients that make the pharmaceutical products. China leads in that, but India is developing capacity very rapidly in collaboration with US technology companies to make that happen. Again, targeting this supply chain resilience that I talked about earlier. At Amrit, we do a tremendous amount of work in medical devices. And today, about 70% of the revenue in medical devices in India is the product of American companies. But this year, the Indian government announced a very ambitious new medical device policy. In fact, on Friday this week, uh, I'm going to, I want my new article on the subject of India's medical device policy and the opportunities it creates for foreign companies to become more vigorous in India, uh, that article is going to come out. And anybody who listens to this webinar, either the live version or the recorded one, can send me a message on LinkedIn or otherwise. I'll be happy to share that article with, with whoever wants it. It's probably going to publish in one of the Life Science Connect publications, such as Medical Device Online. So already companies such as Siemens and GE Healthcare are manufacturing have factories in India. And then there are third parties making tens of millions of dollars of product in India, some of which is exported out of India into China, into Europe, into Africa, into uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but this is going to grow at more than 20% per year if all of the things that India's policy envisions you know, are going to become real. So there's a huge opportunity for Western companies or Asian companies to leverage the incentives, the production linked incentives or subsidies that the Indian government is willing to offer to medical technology companies to put up factories or put up partnerships in India. I talked about pharma already, so I won't dwell on it further. Um, India has more than a billion cell phones and much of the cell phone infrastructure, not just the handsets, that I talked about earlier, uh, which Samsung is as its largest handset factory in Greater Noida near New Delhi. Uh, you see the picture of Tim Cook with India's prime minister. He was there earlier this year to inaugurate uh, the first Apple stores in India, in New Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, but uh, there's a tremendous production of telecom infrastructure, whether it is the antennas, the, the land connections, uh, all of the equipment that goes into making the uh, telecom infrastructure more reliable, including fiber optic networks uh, and all of that. So all of the global companies that produce telecom hardware and software are very much operational in India. And this will continue to grow. India is soon going to become the largest data consumer in the world uh, because of the amount of time Indians spend on their 4G phones. Uh, watching entertainment content in particular. So uh, there's a significant uh, ongoing increase in demand to manufacture product in India, as well as use India as a base to export product. 20 years ago, India was really nowhere in terms of high quality food processing. And Indian companies realized that if you just sell the raw material, you make a certain amount of money. But if you convert that raw material into edible product, your margins go up significantly. So that has now happened. India has world-class food processing facilities across the country. And many of these are now available to be able to take input from anywhere in the world and transform it into edible product for shipment anywhere. You'll already see some of these products in, in American grocery stores. Uh, it's not so visible yet because most of this is on an OEM basis, but it's really starting to increase. So anybody who's in the food, food production or processing business should really consider India as a source. Uh, of course, you know that India's history going back thousands of years uh, was very strong in textiles. 
But when the British ruled India for 200 years, they reversed the flow where India, instead of being an exporter of textiles, was forced under the British rule to import textiles from Manchester and other British locations. Well, 75 years of independence has changed that, and now India is a significant exporter of the highest quality cotton, as well as products made from cotton, from cotton and from synthetic fibers. Here I'm hi highlighting India's capability and interest in what are called smart textiles. And those of you who don't know what smart textiles are, basically what you wear is going to become intelligent. Uh, it will have electrical sensitivity and capability to measure pressure, temperature, uh, those kinds of uh, factors. So this is usable for human beings as they exercise, as they go into cold, cold or hot conditions. But it's also going to apply to the booming robotic industry. People tell me that within five years, we will have $5,000 or $3,000 personal robots in our homes. And those robots need to have tactile sensitivity. It can't just be metal uh, touching metal. You know, if they're going to open your fridge or load your uh, clothes washer with your clothes, they need to be able to have some, some sense of touch and pressure. And that's going to be provided by smart textiles, which will be you know, produced and integrated in a significant amount in India. We're currently working with a company that's doing exactly that for the robotics business. Okay. So India used to be very nervous about drones and anything that flies. And just in the last five years, the government has changed its approach. So they are encouraging the production of all kinds of drones. They're using small drones flying at low altitude to map out the entire country down to the down to the last inch. This is very important because historically India has had a lot of disputes over real estate, particularly rural or agricultural real estate. So by using these small drones with cameras, they are going to be able to map it out. And that's very important to India because once a farmer can define his property, his or her property very clearly, then they can take a loan against it. And they can use that loan to plant crops and be able to, to make money without having to borrow from, uh, from uh, third parties. So it's a significant move by the government, uh, but it's then you know, resulting in this huge drone industry. At the high end, there are com there's, a, there's a company in India that's now worth a billion dollars. It's a unicorn producing drones for the Indian army. And of course, they rely on technology and product that is being imported from other countries. So if you're in the drone business, I think one of the attendees mentioned something about drones. There's going to be a tremendous interest from Indian entities because they can't really do everything themselves. They're going to be in the design and assembly business, I think, and they're going to rely on hardware and software coming from the world over. Okay. So that's the end of my formal presentation. I am happy to take questions of any kind from anyone. That's great. Thank you, good John. Really, really great, great summary and appreciate it. Uh, um, what questions do you have? Lothar, um, is India, I know you have resources in India. Did you have any specific questions about some of the industries that uh, Gunjan talked about or do you have other questions? No, I really don't. You know, we have a number of IT providers in India and also a chartered accounting company, but we don't really have any manufacturing or anything like that. We're more in the service okay. service spectrum. Yeah, I, that's, I that's of course, a huge, huge sector, Lothar. Um, and I didn't talk about it in this presentation because I was bringing out new opportunities. Uh, but the knowledge-based workers, whether they are in accounting or software or IT, uh, you know, now employ a good five to 10 million people in India at some of the highest salaries that Indians make. So do you do you have vendors who do this or do you have your own team? Uh, we have a number of independent associates in India. They're not our employees. They're, they're independent contractors who we represent in the United States and other countries throughout the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're very global. We have 30 some countries with ZG Worldwide Associates. But, but our, our presence in India is actually quite large. 
and your presence is through uh, getting these people connected to vendors that are typically are in different places, not in India. Right. Okay. Very good. So yeah, Gunjan, I mean, that's kind of the historic uh, segment that we, most of us know, right? Over the last several decades, uh, information technology workers. And how is that segment faring given that the world is becoming more competitive? Um, and you've got different parts of the world opening up. I have a meeting right after this conversation with a new member out of the Philippines. Obviously, that's a long time competitor, not as successful or effective as India. However, they're pretty successful. Yeah, <laughs> and, they and are. So let me let me answer the point about the Philippines. A significant number of Indian companies employ tens of thousands of people in the Philippines. Okay. Wow. So, so Indian companies do not see the Philippine entities as threats. They really see them as resources. Interesting. Um, and the way that many of them are using the, you know, uh, the partnerships in the Philippines or their own employees in the Philippines is that Filipinos generally can speak English with an American accent since Philipp the Philippines was an American colony not so long ago. Okay. And oh. so, you know, if if you have a back office providing support or customer service, more and more people want to do as much as they can through chat or text, because that can be automated, that can use AI. Okay? But a good deal of it has to be done by voice. And you know, there's a vibrant business in India training people how to speak with an American accent, but that's that has been a challenge to grow that sector. So it's growing and it's large, but Indian companies say, hey, we go to the Philippines, we can hire someone who an American can understand readily. So why not do that? Yeah. So it's a very cool. One of my good friends has an equal number of employees in both the Philippines and India. Um, another threat that you did not mention, Doug, that I think is on the minds of most people who work in this knowledge world is the threat that AI will take their jobs. So at the, G, at the G20 summit that happened in India earlier this month, just before that, there was a B20 summit, the business leaders from all over the world. And one of the takeaways from that was that India will not lose employment because of AI. In fact, it will gain employment because AI will enable people in India with very limited skills to now start programming and taking away some of the lower end skills that the whole world needs. So the largest IT services company in India is called TCS, Tata Consultancy Services. They're almost half a million employees now, and they're expecting to accelerate their employment as a result of AI. It was very surprising to me, but if you think about what AI is doing, you know, it's really making humans more productive. And yep. so uh, Indian companies feel that it's going to be a positive factor. Now, it's let me turn, let me turn also to Lothar's situation. Do you have more than 100 people in India, Lothar, at this time? Well, uh, in a way we do. You know, we, we have one company uh, that has several hundred employees. But it's there, like I said, that, that company is not our, it, it, we don't, we're not employers. You know what I mean? We're just, yeah. con they're, they're contractors for us. Yeah. So, so if you head, head count, in India starts to approach 100, you might want to think about creating a subsidiary of your own and having direct control over some of these people who are working through third parties. That's usually the threshold number which you need to be able to overcome the overhead of having direct employment in India. Uh, many people can do it with much smaller headcounts, but if you're in the kind of business you described, uh, that's something you might want to consider. Uh, we are setting up a company for a friend of mine uh, who will have seven employees in India, but he expects to grow it to about 40 within within two years. And so it's making sense for him to incorporate a subsidiary, in his case, in the city of Chennai, because he has someone he knows who lives in Chennai who can run that unit. There's something to consider. Yeah, R Rishab is the name of the company, and they they are in several cities, and I think they have three hundred some employees in, in the several cities. I see, I see, wonderful. Okay, 
Any other questions, Lothar, or any other questions in, in the audience, please? Yeah, Gunjan, thank you very much for that presentation summary. It was great. Um, actually, very clean, clear, and straight to the point. Um, uh, I, obviously, during the last slide, um, that caught my interest, um, but also a lot of the other big industry that's currently in India, um, I think it's related to, and that's drones. Um, more so than, you know, uh, just as a background, we're a small um, software development company based out of Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., and we specialize in drone simulation for training, for commercial training from military, police, fire, agriculture, mining, all of the sectors pretty much, even power, gas, all of it. Yeah. Um, and, and any industry or vertical today globally that utilize or has these types of sectors, which pretty much every fairly large uh, you know, country has, uh, they're utilizing drones as a as a large asset to you know uh do jobs um uh that otherwise would be very difficult to do very costly to do and and not as effective yeah um so with that said we have a global presence granted it's a smaller one as we are still a small team but we have a large presence especially in the united states um i would easily tell you that majority of our our uh customers are um uh, universities and public schools all across the states, but we have some interest from training companies or companies that are looking to grow um, their presence in India. Yeah. And we have a few customers existing, um, but after our most recent event, um, the inquiries have come up and more, more attention has come our way. And we want to know what's the best way to go about, you know, sourcing the right, um, you know, or, or looking towards the right type of customers, as well as, um, you know, if there's any government possibilities there as well as uh, we have a few government contracts here in the U.S. that we were luckily uh, awarded, as well as currently working on an Australian Department of Defense contract with our simulator as well. So it's it, there's a lot of possibilities in every avenue. And I just want to kind of pick your brain and understand where would you start if you were me or where would you look towards uh, in India? Yeah. So one thing that you have to really invest some time and effort uh, yeah. is in evaluating the quality of those leads. And I mean, you, we do that routinely in the US. You know, if you get 100 leads from a show, you want to classify the most promising ones based on whatever criteria. And we know how to do that as an American company. You know how to do that very well with American prospect, right? But when you are looking at prospects coming from the other side of the planet, things are sometimes not what they seem. In yeah. both good and a bad way. Sometimes a company that appears very small or insignificant may be a very important prospect for you. And sometimes somebody who talks up a big game, you know, may, may, there may be nothing behind them. I mean, I'll give you an extreme example that happened early, early on in our uh, development of Amrit, uh, this, you know, this company had a, you know, we did some work in the video game business, Brandon, and mm -hmm. this company had a very you know, impressive booth at a video game show. One of our clients was very impressed by them. The person manning the show was a former McKinsey partner. He had a very credible story and our client wanted to give an initial significant, you know, uh, mm -hmm more than a seven-figure project to them. And I just had a little bit of unease. And I said, look, I'm planning to go to India. Why, <laughs> I, why don't I visit these people for a couple of days? Okay. So long story short, that impressive booth and the impressive person at the trade show was all a facade. We ended up in an electronics warehouse where the son of the owner had an ambition to be in the video game business. Uh -huh. He was sitting in one cubicle and next to him was another cubicle where two people were sitting, learning the basic tools of video game software. Yep. That was it. They were working full-time as warehouse employees and part-time they were learning the, the tools. Wow. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Y you have to respect the the effort you know you do yeah. have to respect the effort and the the the, the trial there but uh, definitely um, something to learn from for sure I'm saying 180 degree opposite example yeah we, we helped a company 
that was in the plumbing business and they wanted to buy brass and bronze uh, components from India. Mm -hmm. My team looked in all the major cities and we weren't happy. And then I got a lead that there is a set of small companies in a tiny town called Jamnagar on the coast of Gujarat. Okay. My people didn't even want to go there. They said, this is a complete waste of time, Gunja. Okay. Uh, and my senior person at that time was an MIT graduate, very smart, working in Bangalore. He flew out to that town and he came back absolutely amazed. These Gujarati entrepreneurs are all related. They're kind of competing with each other, but not really. None of their factories had even sign, signage outside. They were all very humble people. But mm -hmm. if you gave them enough volume for a particular part, they would build a machine for that purpose. They didn't use machining centers, lathes, milling machines, whatever. They would build a custom machine to produce just that part and nothing else. And they were wow. able to get a very high quality at very reasonable prices. And most of their customers were European companies at that time. Uh, but you know, you wouldn't have given them the time of day if somebody sent you a picture of the outside of the building or had a conversation with one of the owners because they barely spoke any English. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but our, our our client then visited them and they were from the East Coast. And you know, immediately they signed a deal for several components. So things are not what they seem sometimes. And uh -huh. you really need to conduct some due diligence on those prospects. You can't reuse Dun and Brad Street or Hoover's for that. It doesn't work very well, in my experience. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, you know, you just, by, by if you have 100 leads, maybe 10 of them are very good, and you just need to sort out which 10, and then you will do well in India. Um, I'm actually coming out to your neighborhood on the weekend. Uh, you you oh, said wow. to Washington, right? Yeah, right uh, north of uh, Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. area. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So I would advise you to conduct some serious due diligence before you start spending effort. Um, I had another, another client who was in the aircraft leasing business, and they got an inquiry from the Indian Air Force, and they were ready to jump on a plane and make a presentation. And I was able to dissuade them simply because I saw who had sent the inquiry. And that individual was at a rank that they couldn't even buy a cup of coffee. So oh. They were not going to be, they could make all the inquiries they wanted, but <laughs> it was just not going to be worth their while to buy out there. Okay. Understood. Those are the kind yeah, of and, to sort out. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if, if I, if I guess, um, I guess the question for you is where would you search if you wanted to actively promote your business in India? Uh, and, and you know, the, the pretense of what we, what I do and what we do, um, and, and it being software, not something physically, uh, you know, you have, you don't have to worry so much about logistics and, and kind of a smoother, simpler process, but it is in demand globally. Um, where would you start? What would you look to do, you know, in that sense, if I may, from, from, you know, either Indian government or Indian, uh, you know, federal uh, law enforcement, things of that nature, where would you start? Yeah. Um, so selling into the government, whether it's in the U.S. or in India, is a whole nother beast compared to selling mm -hmm. to corporations. Um, your product will have application at the state level. You know, India has mm -hmm. 29 states. Some states are a lot easier to do business with than others. And I would focus on those states. Um, the federal government has lots of money to spend. But again, it's department by department. You know? So if it's the Ministry of Defense, you know, they are really worried about India's external borders. Then there is the home ministry, which is more about, more like our homeland security. Okay. And within it, there are many, many uh, separate units. Uh, there are the police forces, which are largely state run, but there is something called the Central Industrial Security Force, CISF, which secures all of the airports, which secures large factories and many other establishments. And some of those are easier to sell to. Now, I mean, I would need to really have an offline conversation with you to understand yeah. all of the nuances of your business to be able to say where you should focus first. But our client, Trichikon, whom I mentioned earlier, I can take mm -hmm. some of these names because we did the work long ago and the confidentiality experience, you know, agreements have expired. But Trichikon did a tremendous job selling to the state police forces trying to sell to the Central Indian Army, which wanted to buy a million rifles 
you know, was a much, much harder job for them. So we yeah. had them focus on the state and city level security, and they did a very good job there. Uh, and that's told, where they started, right? That, that's where they grew very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, software, in a sense, is an easier sale because you don't have physical deliveries involved. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can set the software so that, you know, there's, there's very little chance of piracy. I'm sure you know how to do that with software as a service. Uh, there seems to be a training component to what you do. And that yes. might require some travel to India, which is actually going to be a good thing for you. What I, okay. what I asked is, let's, you know, let's get you guys connected and maybe uh, over the next week or two, you guys can connect up even, you know, Gunjan. You said you're in D.C. next week? Or in Maryland. No, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow just for the weekend. India's, wow. India's external affairs minister is in town and they invited me to come see him. So I'm just, Outstanding. There, just there for the weekend. Yeah. Thank you very much for your information and insight. Um, I definitely, if, if you're open to a physical meeting or a uh, virtual meeting offline, um, that I would greatly appreciate that and any more insight that you might have. Sure, we can take that offline, I'm sure. Doug or his colleague can connect us together. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank Happy you. Time. Well, thank thank you, gentlemen, uh, for the the time today, and all the viewers. If you're watching this uh, via uh, video, uh, Gunjan, any final comments and thoughts that you'd like to make? Uh, either uh, kind of the the general question that Brandon asked really was, "What should I do next?" Right? Like whatever your business is, your product or service, sure. you may. You see people, you make some initial mistakes, and that ends up setting off a cascade of things that ultimately lead to a suboptimal success or worse. Um, what What are some of the things that people should think about, and what other comments do you have in closing? Yeah. So, um, one thing I would say when you look, when you deal with India, if you are new to the country, you know, you have to have a sense of humility. You, you have to understand that when an Indian says something odd or strange, it doesn't, don't automatically assume that you are somehow superior to them. Okay. I think we as Americans tend to do that wherever we go, but particularly in India, and some of the things that we take for granted are not the way they are seen. So in, in, in the US, we say, call a spade a spade. You know, be, be direct, say what you mean and mean what you say. In Asia, in general, that is not appreciated. Uh, the uh, wisdom lies in the uh, in the uh, texture of what is said, and sometimes in our pressure to be direct, we stop listening carefully enough to the Indian counterpart. So, by humility, I don't mean you you know denigrate or degrade yourself, but listen with great curiosity, the curiosity of a child almost to listen to. If you they say something strange. Ask them to explain. I say, I'm not sure what that means. Can you explain that to me? Okay, And people will give you some information. If you can turn to an expert who has dealt with India before, they might also be of some help. Okay, India is not an opaque society. Okay, India is not a society where you, know, you have to learn the language. Well, business is conducted in English. But the Indians think, do not think American. They may speak English, but they don't think American. And so you need to cross that barrier. Okay? If you're doing significant business with India, then it's really important to spend time there. You can't do it by phone and Zoom, no matter what. I, I'm called an India expert. I travel to India several times a year. And there has not been one trip to India in the last 20 years where I haven't come back saying, oh, gee, I learned something significant. I've been doing something silly all these years. Okay? Every single trip, including the one in May this year, that's exactly what happened to me at least twice. Okay. So uh, those would be my general tips. Uh, some of these points are covered in my book on doing business in India in the cross-cultural communication chapter. See, the challenge is, Doug, that you know, when you're doing, doing business with China, Japan, or Korea, you know they don't understand you. So you hire an interpreter, translator, whatever. But for good or for bad, most Americans find that they have an Indian physician or an Indian co-worker. And they say, oh, I can understand him or her, so I must understand India. You know, nothing could be further from the truth because your Indian physician or co-worker has been away from India for so long that they don't understand India either. 
and India has changed since they left. Okay. So those are the you know general closing thoughts I would leave you with. Lulled into believing that you're understood or that, or that you're understanding. Um, exactly. so that's a really good point. Uh, thank you so much, Gunjan, for uh, sharing today. Thanks all of you here and also on the video. If you're interested in learning more, uh, contact Gunjan directly. He's easy to find on LinkedIn. He's got a very strong presence there. And if nothing else, uh, you can send an email to info at globalchamber.org, and we're happy to make the introduction. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very Thank much, you. guys. Have Thank a wonderful you, evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gunjan. Really appreciate it.